Welcome to Sharper Iron. Spend the next hour with us studying the living and active Word of God. His two-edged sword of law and gospel, recorded for you in Holy Scripture, all about Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. Thanks for tuning in this morning here on Worldwide KFUO. Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. I am your host, Pastor Timothy Apple of Grace Lutheran Church in Smithville, Texas. Thank you to our generous underwriters on Sharper Iron, the Lutheran Church Extension Fund, where your investments help support the work of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Visit lcef.org for more information. And Luther Classical College, a college for Lutherans by Lutherans, opening in fall 2025. Learn more at lutherclassical.org. On this Monday, September 12th, we are studying Deuteronomy chapter 22, verses 13 to 30. Moses gives Israel instructions for a variety of cases with the intention of protecting God's gift of marriage. To help us sharpen our faith in Christ as we study God's Word today, we have with us returning guest, Pastor Doug Gribbenau. Pastor Gribbenau serves as mission advocate for KFUO Radio in St. Louis, Missouri. Pastor Gribbenau, welcome back to Sharp Iron. Well, thank you, brother, and, and thank you, brothers and sisters, for having me back. So we get to talk about part of Deuteronomy chapter 22 today, Pastor Gribbenau. Before we jump into that text, give us a little bit of context. Remind us where we are in the book of Deuteronomy, what Moses is up to as we jump in. Well, certainly. The actual name uh, of, of this book of the Bible, and, and I had not realized this till I ended up going to seminary, is these names are in Greek. Uh, Deuteronomy is Deuteronomos, or, or the second law. So it's the second telling, uh, which God does very often because we sinful creatures have a bad habit of not listening. <laughs> And we see that with Israel all over time, over and over again, the Israel of the Old Testament and the Israel of the New Testament, you and I, brothers and sisters in Christ. And, and so we've been coming through with, uh, with a second telling, a reminder of what it is to be God's people, you know, how it is that, that we are to live. And so often this is, it's written in a prescriptive way. You shall, you shall not. And and yet the overarching reality of it is descriptive you know as as god's law is a, a a manifestation an extension of his will and we know what the will of god is that all should be saved and to come to repentance and come to the truth and come to life everlasting in his son as we hear in the gospel of john right for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever should believe in him should not perish, but have life everlasting. And so Deuteronomy, in fact, all of God's law, is descriptive of how it is we are in Christ and enlivened by the Holy Spirit. So as much as it is uh, prescriptive in the, in the first and second use of the law, right, to bind the old Adam and to, and to quell and quash the sinful desires of the flesh, it is also in its third use, a beautiful acclamation as to who God's people are, because they are in the image of Christ, being conformed to that image by the work of the Holy Spirit. And so coming in here to to this section of of chapter 22, uh, laws concerning sexual immorality, as the editors in the English Standard Version uh, have, have dubbed this section, we, we're just passing out of various laws, uh, which has been you know, describing the whole uh, civic life of God's people and, and cultic life, that is the, the worship life, as well as, as the moral life of his people. And this especially uh, in, in this relatively challenging section um, is, and I don't want to steal the thunder, but this is really another view of and a descriptive view of of our life in Christ, and uh, and you have to stick with me to explain how that is, right? A little teaser to keep you keep you tuned in. <laughs> okay, all right, that that sounds good. That sounds good. I, yeah, the the ESV does call the previous section various laws, and in this part of Deuteronomy, there has been a bit of jumping around by Moses in the sense that it's not necessarily one particular law seems to follow as maybe logically as we might want it to, but certainly we are dealing with matters pertaining to the Decalogue, Moses laying out in various ways how the people of Israel will apply 
those commandments to their everyday lives. Particularly in this section, we are dealing with matters of the second table, how you love your neighbor as yourself. And as, as you've said, this section has a little more coherence in the sense that these things are going to go together. The ESV says laws concerning sexual immorality. I think for our purposes, and, and anytime I, I talk about matters pertaining to the sixth commandment as a pastor, I always like to try to emphasize the very positive aspect of why God gives the sixth commandment. And and just like in every commandment, God gives it in order to protect a very precious gift. So it is with the sixth commandment. The sixth commandment protects God's gift of marriage. And so, Pastor Gribbenau, before we dig into specifics of this text, I think it would be worthwhile to to meditate a little bit and to to wonder at the great gift of marriage and the great good that God gives in marriage. So I'll let you get started. Well, certainly. We, of course, were, were chatting briefly before we went on the air, as, as we always sort of do. And and I was pulling up my small catechism. I have a, the most recent uh, wording or phrasing that we've used. Uh, and the sixth commandment, and in fact, you, you noted this, uh, was that the sixth commandment is you shall not commit adultery. And of course, the question, the good Lutheran question, what does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we lead a sexually pure and decent life in what we say and do, and husband and wife love and honor each other. Now, you you remarked, and it, and it struck me because I hadn't realized this, this is the commandment that that doesn't follow with a we should fear and love God so that we do not, but instead we should fear and love God so that we, so that we do, and and that's a wonderful way for us to view that that this is a gift, uh, the sexuality of of man and woman, is is a gift of God and a, a a way in which we participate with with the Father in this creative act of bringing. Uh, the the blessing of a child, of a new human being, a new body and and soul into creation. And, and he has blessed us to be a part of that work with him as he knits that child together in the womb after mother and father uh, have, have come together, as we would say, right? And and the Lord blesses them with a child and opens the womb to, to yield this new creative act. And so th- this human sexuality is, is to be exercised and is to be enjoyed within within the bounds where it is uh, where it is beautiful and God pleasing and and beneficial for us and and for our neighbor. So I mean, with with the sixth commandment and the gift of marriage, I think there's there's a couple of things that we we should talk about because on the one hand, it's certainly very important for the husband and the wife within their relationship as husband and wife, that they would love and honor each other, to use the language of the meaning that Luther gives. Amen. But there's also a, a reason that this commandment is given, not just for those two specific people, but even as we see within what the, we'll look at in the text from Deuteronomy today, the gift of marriage has a, a blessing not only for the husband and wife and for the children that they bear, as you've already talked about, but there's a, a greater blessing for society as a whole, for the world at large. So. Talk a little bit about both of those things. What what's the and you've already started in on, on the first part about the the blessing to the husband and wife and why marriage is such a gift, but how also so give us more of that, but then also expand it. How is marriage and the protection of it so important for society as a whole? Well, first and and foremost, looking at uh, you know, this idea of the nearest neighbor. Um and and Luther spoke of that that we should you know love our neighbor as ourselves. Who is your nearest neighbor? But but your spouse, and and, and next to that, right there is is your children. And so marriage was established by God that that children would be brought up and and raised in this in this view that God has given us this understanding of marriage of a father and a mother. They are they are unique. They are. Uh, distinct. There are many commonalities. The the, the love and care uh, and and the discipline of children that that parents participate in with each other, but they are uniquely different, and not just because they're different human beings, but because the the role and responsibility of a father 
and the role and the responsibility of a mother are are distinct and and the care of children is to have this uh, this this dual bounds brought with them now of course the the greater reality as as we hear in the epistles is that husband and wife man and woman as we understand them is actually but a a a shadow, if you will, or a reflection of the greater and full reality of what marriage is, and that is Christ and his church. And this is what makes it so uniquely and, and, and distinctive from just any sort of general union of persons, was that you have a, an entire giving uh, and an entire receiving and reciprocal giving. Christ has loved the world so much, loved you and I, loved his bride, the church, that he gave everything of himself and emptied himself because it was what was best for her, that is for you and I. And then in like response, we are faithful and true and we, and we hold fast to his guidance and his, uh, his teaching and his love, knowing that all that he does is for our benefit. All we do is for his honor, his glory, and, and for the benefit of, of all of us. Uh, that, that this is a, a union of, of, of service, of both receiving blessing and of giving thanks. And I feel like I've said a lot of things and I maybe didn't say enough. <laughs> Well, I know there's there's always there's always more I think that could be said on on this, and it, it really is quite something when you start to mine the depths. Like you you are taking us into say Ephesians five, where Paul does make that that wonderful comparison that you were talking about. I hadn't even mentioned yet, but I'm glad you did. That the the picture of marriage is a picture of Christ and the church, and so especially for us as Christians, then you know that just adds another layer to the gift that not only is what God gives us in the sixth commandment in marriage, something that is good for us. It is good for the husband and the wife to be married. It is good for them to cherish that gift and to nurture that gift. It is good for society as a whole to receive that gift of marriage and to you know, honor it and to protect it. All of those are what, what, what sometimes we might call first article gifts. They belong to God's creation and those are very good but but even more so for the christian than to recognize how that gift of marriage is a picture of what christ has done or the relationship that christ has with his church and then the way that the church receives from christ just adds another layer to the gift so that we receive it all the more with thanksgiving and honor it and protect it all the more so that that testimony to what Christ has done for his church and the way the church receives from Christ is continued to be put forth in the world by protecting and honoring this gift of marriage. Does that make sense? Amen. So let's let's keep I mean cuz you said there's more that can be can be said always. And and one thing that that I have always appreciated when it comes to marriage is the, what I like to call the pastoral matrimonial address within the Lutheran service book. There's just some beautiful language as to the benefits of marriage there. And again, I think as we prepare to read a text that speaks very much about some of the abuses against marriage, to see the great light that God shines upon marriage, the gift that it is, helps us to appreciate why a text like this, which may be a uncomfortable, it's very helpful to us still. So I just, I'll, if you will, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read a little bit from the, the pastoral address at the beginning of the marriage service. And I just appreciate any comments you have uh, to add to it, to, to, again, help us to meditate on the gift of marriage. So and if I'm going to read, this is at home has your Lutheran service book handy. Uh, you can turn to page 275 and can read you. along with us. I got my agenda open. And, and you're looking in the hymnal. Very good. What was the page number in Lutheran service book? In the hymnal, it is 275. 275 in Lutheran service book. Very good. So this is, this is the last large paragraph. The union of husband and wife in heart, body, and mind is intended by God 
for the mutual companionship, help, and support that each person ought to receive from the other, both in prosperity and adversity. Marriage was also ordained so that man and woman may find delight in one another. Therefore, all persons who marry shall take a spouse in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust. For God has not called us to impurity, but in holiness. God also has established marriage for the procreation of children, who are to be brought up in the fear and instruction of the Lord, so that they may offer him their praise. I find those words so very helpful to hear, not only for the man and the woman who are about to enter into the gift of marriage on that day when those words are spoken, but for all who hear them sitting in the pews, the husbands and wives, that they might be reminded of this wonderful gift that God has given, again, for the mutual companionship and support, to find delight in each other, and for the procreation of children. Again, this is the the precious gift of marriage through which God gives us so many good gifts. And with that in mind, then I guess that, you know, it's like, why wouldn't we want to protect it? And that's, that's, I think, such an important thing to keep in mind as we prepare to look at this text. I'll, please, further comments, Pastor Grimino. Well, you know, you didn't read the first paragraph and, and sometimes I'm Go a ahead. naughty kid and I, and I read while someone else is reading. <laughs> right? <laughs> My mind wanders I'll occasionally, but I was, le- I was listening. But one thing that, that, that we overlook sometimes is how is the importance of of marriage, that this is really sort of the archetype of the reality we have as, as Christians, as those called in to be a part of this body of Christ, was that the very first miracle that the incarnate Lord performed Mm. was turning the water into wine at the wedding feast, the marriage feast there in Cana. And that really ought to set off a, a little, uh, you know, a light bulb in our head that says, he, this is this is really sort of the archetype. This is what we're going to see reflected throughout his entire earthly ministry, and also then reflected there in the the Old Testament in all that is leading up to this incarnation. That this is this is a marriage. This is that 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 uh, agape love, that self sacrificing, steadfast love that God would give everything of Himself for us. Uh, to win we who have been faithless and and wandering and to and to make us pure and holy and beautiful as as a bride adorned with the most precious thing of all which is the blood of Christ Jesus and so our lord you know commends this and celebrates this gift of marriage with the very first miracle he performs mm. Certainly, that is a very important point, and what a wonderful testimony from Jesus, simply by example, to show how he does love marriage. It's remarkable how something that seems so ordinary, I mean, the the union of a, a husband and a wife has been happening throughout history, and yet that's the way our Lord chose to introduce himself for that first sign in the Gospel of John in John chapter 2 is at a wedding. He he cares about that simple gift of created life that comes through marriage. And, and what a what a wonderful testimony for our Lord. I, I do think that most of our conversation so far has centered primarily on that gift of marriage to the husband and the wife themselves, and then by extension to their family, particularly the children that God may give them. Still, I I think there's something more that we can say about how this gift then helps society as a whole. And, and also, I mean, you know, like, so in the, within the explanation, you know, where it says, Luther says, husband and wife love and honor each other. Well, what if I'm not a husband or a wife? How does this commandment apply to me? And and why is it important that I still honor marriage? This is a, it is, it's a very astute observation. And to be honest, I'm going to look something up. Would you mind expanding a little bit on where on where you, you're viewing to take this conversation? Sure. sure. So my, my thought is that the husband and the wife, right? This is an important foundational relationship for their own family. You know, as you said, the husband and wife, God gives them children. They become mother and father. They nurture and raise those children. That's great for those, say, two people plus however many kids. So we'll, we'll say seven because that's how many are, are in my family right now. So seven total people, the gift of marriage is great because you got the two, the two parents and then their kids. But why should my neighbor over here, 
who's not a husband or a wife or not one of my own kids, why should they care about marriage being protected? What what does that that's kind of what I'd like to think about. And I I I think that when my family is healthy and your family is healthy and and the families around us are healthy, then together and we're we're healthy because we're holding on to God's word and seeking to follow it because we know it's good, then together that benefits all of us rather than just my own personal family. That there's something, I guess what I'm trying to to hopefully talk a little bit more about is that the gift of marriage goes beyond just the the individual family, but it ends up benefiting like my whole town, my whole church, ultimately the world when marriages are healthy. Amen. Does that make sense? Yes. And okay. and speaking in a in a purely sort of left hand kingdom, you know the the world and and the pragmatic concerns we might have, um, healthy marriages, healthy families, uh, healthy children, and I mean this in the holistic sense of of, of mind, body, and soul, are um, are equipped and ready to help and to build up the neighbor. Um, because because they are strengthened and established with God to to be of service. When we are beset by illness, be that of mind, body, or soul, uh, we we become that member of society that needs help, that needs attention, that needs care. In in broken families, we very often have uh, one parent who is struggling to to fill two vocations and to care for the children and to be the breadwinner and to be a, a you know a good citizen contributing to the to the economy and to our community to our culture it is a tremendous weight uh, to be born by one parent uh, and and also a tremendous weight that's born by the children because the we all know that we can't wear two hats at the same time. You can't be a jack of all trades and a master of all trades at the same time, right? And so the the children have half of a parent because that parent has to then be filling two vocations. Even more drastically, uh, orphans, children who who don't have parents. Uh, in a pragmatic sense, you know, we we have the wards of the state. Uh, we we have you know the foster care system. We have um, you know. All of these that are that are a financial, and I don't want to say the word burden, but it is a weight that that the community bears uh, to support these who have been beset by the corruption of this world of a broken marriage, a broken family, uh, and and so in a very pragmatic sense, healthy families, healthy parents, healthy children uh, are not to speak in the negative sense, a burden in society because they're, they're prepared and ready to contribute and to build up and to help. And so when we, when we shatter that family or when that family is shattered by, by the sin in this world, uh, the community at large, and rightly so, needs to gather together to help and to build and to assist the, the part of our, of our community body that needs help. Um, and and so by strengthening each other's families, um, we are instead equipping ourselves to, to help build up the world uh, in, instead of being that member of the body that needs that assistance. And the one thing I will say um, is th- though we have a, a broken world where people are in need of help, this is not something of which we should be ashamed in the sense right. that we need help. When we need help, we need help, and and this is a wonderful thing. Remember, chiefly that that we were lost and condemned sinners, and absolute help, and we needed absolute help because there was nothing we could do to save ourselves. And God has given us that help. In the same manner, in this broken world, we give charity uh, to those who who are in need of charity. And in America, we don't like that word. It's sort of this this dirty word. I don't need your charity. But the thing that I love to point out uh, to those who are in need and to those who are giving is the word charity comes from the Latin caritas. And that word is used for love. And no one <laughs> and no one feels bad about receiving love, and no one feels bad about giving love. And that's really what we should try to 
change our mind and our thought about in terms of charity is that this is loving another human being and and on the receiving end of receiving the love of someone else and and to leave it at that forget the the financial and the prideful things but just be in that caritas in that love hmm. Yeah, I mean, as you were talking, I, I, my mind also started to go a little bit to the tenth commandment, the commandment against coveting, say, your neighbor's wife, particularly in in what we're talking about, and and how this very much does, I think, apply in the sense that you know when I see my neighbor's marriage in trouble, it is not mine to somehow disrupt it further or to undermine it, but it is rather mine to support it, both for their sakes. I mean, so that that they are strengthened in their marriage, and again, that brings great benefit to all people. And and in that way, then, like this this matter of as the sixth commandment reads in the meaning, you know, we should lead a sexually pure and decent life in what we say and do, goes beyond just that gift of marriage to a good for all people. That healthy marriages and and the support of healthy marriages, the support of families, the support of of individuals, right, Where, wherever. God has placed you, married or not, to recognize how together we do help one another, as, as you were describing. And in the support of the gift of marriage, God does a wonderful thing. He structures our world in a beautiful way, and it works for the benefit of all. That's the good gift that God gives. We are sinners, and so he needs to limit that sin. And that's what we do see in Deuteronomy chapter 22, where the Lord reminds people, these are some of the ways that this can go wrong. Here's how to handle it in a God-pleasing way. Here's how to limit the effects of sin upon you and upon your people. With that, we're going to take our break and we will jump into this text on the other side. You're listening to Sharper Iron on KFUO. We're talking Deuteronomy 22 with Pastor Doug Gribbenoff. We'll be right back. Did you know that Lutherans are helping new American immigrants get settled? How about struggling church workers in need of support and refreshment? And we assist at-risk children and provide disaster response to hurricane victims. Through LCMS recognized service organizations, we are doing all this and more. I'm Rahema Kavuga of Lutheran Church Extension Fund, and I don't want you to miss out on hearing what your brothers and sisters in Christ are up to. Visit interesttime.org to see how your support gives life to these works of mercy and love. What do you think of when you hear the word college? Expensive? Liberal? Woke? Imagine a college that is affordable. A college that is unapologetically conservative and Lutheran. A college that won't take a dime of federal funding. A college that teaches the best of our Western heritage. A college where students grow in the Christian faith instead of leaving it behind. This is Luther Classical College. A college by Lutherans and for Lutherans. Visit our website, lutherclassical.org. Subscribe, become a patron, and join the thousands who are making Luther Classical College a reality. Welcome back to Sharper Iron. It is Monday, September 12th. We're studying Deuteronomy 22, verses 13 to 30 with Pastor Doug Gribbenau. He is mission advocate for KFUO Radio in St. Louis, Missouri. Pastor Gribbenau, prior to the break, we spoke at length about the good gift of marriage that God gives and why that is so important, not only for husbands and wives, but for our world as a whole. Before we jump into this text, you said you had one more introductory comment for us to keep in mind. Yeah, and I was looking back at the Tenth Commandment as as we were looking in in marriage and in, and in fostering and strengthening and, and helping others whose marriages are in are in uh, disarray or, or some some disorder, some stress. And part of it is to, to urge them to stay and do their duty. And that reminded me of of what is a hard lesson and a hard understanding for us. I think in, in this in the late twentieth and the and the twenty first century, we tend to think of 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 marriage as just being love. And, and you, you go back to the Princess Bride, you know, love, right? Marriage is what brings us <laughs> two together, right? This love. And, and of course, you have the starry eyes and, and everyone. But the, the love that is marriage is, is not this sort of just fleshly passion uh, as, the, as the pastoral dress gives, but it is it is this agape love. It is this completely self-sacrificing, serving love. And marriage is, is therefore, it's hard work 
because it, it's two saints and two sinners being bound together as as one flesh so that everything that we do intimately and must impact the other uh, in thought, word, and deed. And so marriage is, to, is, is this work that we do, uh, this love that is sacrificing and nourished and understood really in Christ, but in times of prosperity, in times of want, you know, for better or for worse, that marriage is a bonding uh, that God has brought together of a man and woman to become one flesh in times of good and in times of ill. And there is, there is, there is the blessedness of, of that union. There's also the work, the duty that we've pledged to do, to love, honor, and support one another in every occasion, even when we may not, you know, passionately, emotively say, I love you. <laughs> right now, I don't like you very much, right? But I still love you in the agape sense. You are my flesh. You are my body. And, and we'll work through this. And that's the important perspective that I think we're seeing here in Deuteronomy is this breakdown of, of this agape love that is to be the hard work of marriage. Let's go ahead and jump into the text. This is Deuteronomy 22, beginning at verse 13. If any man takes a wife and goes into her and then hates her and accuses her of misconduct and brings a bad name upon her, saying... I took this woman, and when I came near her, I did not find in her evidence of virginity. Then the father of the young woman and her mother shall take and bring out the evidence of her virginity to the elders of the city in the gate. And the father of the young woman shall say to the elders, I gave my daughter to this man to marry, and he hates her. And behold, he has accused her of misconduct, saying, I did not find in your daughter evidence of virginity. And yet this is the evidence of my daughter's virginity and they shall spread the cloak before the elders of the city. Then the elders of the city shall take the man and whip him, and they shall fine him a hundred shekels of silver and give them to the father of the young woman, because he has brought a bad name upon a virgin of Israel, and she shall be his wife. He may not divorce her all his days. But if the thing is true, that evidence of virginity was not found in the young woman, then they shall bring out the young woman to the door of her father's house, and the men of her city shall stone her to death with stones, because she has done an outrageous thing in Israel by whoring in her father's house. So you shall purge the evil from your midst. If a man is found lying with the wife of another man, both of them shall die, the man who lay with the woman and the woman. So you shall purge the evil from Israel. If there is a betrothed virgin, and a man meets her in the city and lies with her, then you shall bring them both out to the gate of that city, and you shall stone them to death with stones, the young woman because she did not cry for help, though she was in the city, and the man because he violated his neighbor's wife. So you shall purge the evil from your midst. But if in the open country a man meets a young woman who is betrothed, and the man seizes her and lies with her, then only the man who lay with her shall die. But you shall do nothing to the young woman. She has committed no offense punishable by death. For this case is like that of a man attacking and murdering his neighbor, because he met her in the open country, and though be the betrothed young woman cried for help, there was no one to rescue her. If a man meets a virgin who is not betrothed, and seizes her and lies with her, and they are found, then the man who lay with her shall give to the father of the young woman fifty shekels of silver, and she shall be his wife, because he has violated her. He may not divorce her all his days. A man shall not take his, co his father's wife so that he does not uncover his father's nakedness. That's our text for today. That's Deuteronomy 22, verses 13 to 30. So, Pastor Gribbon, the first scenario that Moses describes is a man who's taken a wife, and he makes an accusation against her. And the way that Moses describes it is how you see if it's true or not and what to do in either case. So take us into this first scenario Moses gives. Certainly. The this gives us the the image of and and we assume but sort of by inference though it's not explicit that this is a newlywed couple or at least a very relatively newlywed couple mm. um, context being uh, having this the cloak that has the proof of virginity or not uh, I'm not sure how long one would keep that they certainly didn't have you know like Every seven years, you can throw away all the old cloaks, but uh, right. so this would be a relatively recent thing. Um, but more than this is in the very first uh, verse, in verse 13. If a man takes a wife and goes into her and then 
hates her and accuses her of misconduct yeah. and brings a bad name upon herself. It, it stands out, you know, and he, and he hates her. And we're not given the context of why he hates her. But here is a husband who now hates, and, and there's really no other good translation for this Hebrew word, hates his wife. Um, the, the implication then being there's, there's two possibilities. Either he's lying or she has been unfaithful uh, and, and is not a virgin of Israel but has, has been fornicating outside of marriage and committing adultery. Right. Now, this, the first case, I would say, is, is perhaps the more likely case in this event. That's why it's treated first in the text. Uh, you, you have a nefarious guy who just doesn't want to be married to this woman anymore. You know, he just decided, I'm done with it. So he's abdicating all of his responsibility, all of his vows, all of his promises that he made in marriage uh, that this woman would be his one flesh. And now he wants out. He wants to back out of the deal and say, no more. I'm, I'm out of here. Yep. He, he hates her. And so it is incumbent upon him to, unfortunately, there, it's a he said, she said. And so, as was the practice back then, the, the cloak that is to be brought to the city gate is, is basically the bed linens of the sheet and mm -hmm. the proof of, uh, of virginity would, would be, uh, the blood that is, that is spilt when the man and the wife first have intercourse. And if there's no blood on the, on the cloak that is taken in this, in this judicial aspect here as proof that she was not a virgin. If there is blood on the cloak, it is proof that this man is lying. And the, point of this, we hear this, this condemnation almost that the man can never divorce this woman. <laughs> and in my modern sense, in this 21st century view, I say, oh, that's great. Let's leave the woman with the guy who hates her. Uh, that sounds like a great plan, right? <laughs> but we, we have to put ourselves back into the perspective of what life was like here in this people the, uh, that were called together and, and made Israel, right? Made God's people. If you think of yourself in, uh, put yourself in your mindset of the small town mentality where everyone knows everyone else's business. Uh, everyone knows what else is going on. You know, you, you all know each other. You see each other all the time. There's no secrets. Well, shrink that down even smaller. And that's sort of what the life in, in Israel was like then. Very, very intimate. Everyone knew uh, and watched out for one another. It was, it was a broader, larger family. And, and so the, the point that God is, is bringing forth is to say, this woman who is the wife, who has been taken from her father's household and placed in this new household will be provided for, will be cared for. She will not be cast off uh, and, and she will not be uh, left to fend for herself. God says, this is, this is your wife. You will care for her. You will, you will provide for her. And, and ultimately we pray as we do even today, that God, through his word and through the uh, brothers and sisters nearby, would lead this, this wicked man to repentance, that he would do the hard work and care for this, for this wife. Right. So it's not right. like in our modern age where you have like a broken marriage. You see those people maybe on Sunday. Oh, everything seemed fine. But in fact, he was actually really mistreating his wife. This guy <laughs> has demonstrated himself quite publicly to be not such a wonderful fellow. And everyone in that community, I, you can almost imagine the, the cloaks brought out, the proof of her virginity is there. Every male in that community looks him dead in the eye and says, you're going to treat this woman well. You're going to care for her. You're going to be good to her. And if not, mm -mm. <laughs> right, so That's right. th th this, this woman is, is, is going to be cared for by the community um, or looked out for, we should say, and she's going to be cared for by this husband who is now being called to do his duty, to do what he has promised, to fulfill his word and his oath.
Yeah, that's right. Well, and, and just the fact that it's laid out in that great detail, particularly on that side, as you pointed out, it, I think is is intended to be a deterrent from ever having to get to this place in the first place Amen. so that you think about this before you get married. <laughs> like You don't want this to happen. So make sure that you're committed to marrying this woman before you get there so that you don't have to try this, quote, easy way out, which isn't actually an option to you, and you get shamed in front of everyone. And we talked about this with some previous laws, and I, I think it continues here. Moses lays this out ahead of time for the people so that they understand just how important marriage is, the commitment that is being made, so that they won't go down this path. That He wants them to avoid this. And, and so the penalty is there, that great shame, to avoid it in the first place. And I, I think the way that you you described it in terms of, you know, this is there to protect the woman and and like even just the fact that that he is commanded to stay in that marriage and to support her, that is for her own protection and good, so that she's not just hung out to dry and and treated it as a nobody. But that and and the way that you again describe the social pressure that would be around him, I think is also very helpful to even even if it does go down this path to get that husband to shape up and actually be the husband that God has called him to that's that's what's going on here so let's let's move then to the the next case which is is fairly short and i think maybe the most straightforward verse 22 describes i think generally what we think of when we hear you shall not commit adultery that's pretty much verse 22 take us into that scenario yeah the classic case of adultery uh, uh, a married man a married woman and then they are having sexual relations with someone who is not their spouse um, yeah. outside of marriage. And, 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 and the Lord says, um, you know, so you shall purge the evil from Israel. I mean, the, 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 this is a word that's, that, that carries a, a tremendous gravitas. Both of them shall die. The man who lay with the woman and the woman so uh important so precious is is this institution of marriage uh that that violating it uh, leads to death and again i see a, a a parallel because remember marriage our earthly marriages are a reflection of uh, the marriage of christ and his bride the church and so uh infidelity in a marriage leads to death, especially infidelity in this marriage of, of us with God leads to an even greater death, the, the death of body and soul. Uh, and so it is this tremendous, um, precious gift of marriage. And, and as we sort of see, the, the sexual sins are the most uh, pervasive and and not just today, but in in the old time, Old Testament as well, probably all the way back to the very beginning of man, uh, that this is a, uh, a a tremendous curse with human beings. Uh, David saw Bathsheba, and that lust led to adultery. It led to murder. It led to cover up. Um, it, it, and it led to death, the death of his child. So this is a very uh, dangerous and damaging. Um, uh, situation, and lest the adulterer and the adulteress um, persist in in spreading this this lustfulness within the community, uh, they are to be they are to be expunged. They are to be taken away, lest others may be tempted to fall, and uh, and 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 truly chaos and and depravity. And both spiritual and physical death result amongst all the peoples. Beginning in verse 23, the, through about, I'd say, verse 27, it's a, a pair of cases that I think are intended to go together. But they seem to be describing rape. What's, what's going on as Moses continues? Certainly. In, in 23, we have, we have the case of, uh, of, a, of, a, of a city. Right, and right. we're not talking a metropolis with, with soundproof doors and everything. We're, we're we're talking, you know, probably you know your local dorm room where you, somebody sneezes on the other side of the wall and you know. Uh, so, the idea here is that a betrothed virgin, that is, a woman who has who has been committed to be married, uh, so is already um, 
been been bound to promised to uh, a husband and is you know in in the process of and in the you know ready to go and be married already departing her father's house coming into this new household with her husband uh, a betrothed virgin and a man and he meets her in the city and he lies with her then both of them are brought to the gate of the city you shall stone them to death with stones the reason being that this is not any different than the previously cited case of of a wife of another man and, and a man uh, being being adulterous because the woman who is betrothed within this city it said she did not cry out for help so the the unspoken reality of this phrasing is that she was welcoming the advances of this other man and was committing adultery just as would be the case in verse 22 and so they are to be put to death for the same reasons and for the same penalty and this is because in a city or in this small very close-knit community a woman cries out the men of that city are going to come in find the rapist and and he will suffer a tremendously horrid fate Mm -hmm. and she will have been rescued right as if anyone who is uh, their home has been broken into uh, the thief is is stealing or threatening you cry out the community comes and uh, and rescues so the implication is that by not crying out it was it was a welcome advance and so no different in case than verse 22 mm. But then the difference in 25 is that it's in the open country. And since now now the assumption is she did cry out, no one heard her. And so she is not put to death, but she is the innocent victim and the man is put to death. Amen. And that is exactly the case. You know, uh, what's unspoken in 23 is, you know, should the woman have cried out, the rapist would have been caught and, 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 and punished. In the open country, there is not anyone to hear her crying out. The the case here being that the woman did cry out and and was overcome and and the phrasing here is actually even more important because in verse 25 uh if in the open country a man meets a young woman who is betrothed and the man seizes her and lies with her and that's mm. and that's really that that added description there is that this is a forceful taking this is this is this is rape in in a very sort of classical sense, the unwelcome, unwilling, uh, you know, and forceful thrusting of this man upon upon a betrothed version. Mm. Now, in verse twenty eight, there's a, a man meeting a virgin who's not betrothed. He seizes her and lies with her. So we've got some of the language from both scenarios. What happens there? The betrothed woman is effectively the wife of another man. She is within that household to be cared for and, 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 you know, as his one flesh, an unbetrothed virgin is still within her father's household. And the, the sanctity of, of the, of this, this Parthenos of this virgin is, um, is, has been taken. So in a, in a sort of pragmatic, practical sense, she's no longer she can't she can't be given in marriage right because she's no longer a virgin it has been taken from her this this father and this household um you know she she's going to be bereft and left with with no support uh and so here we have again this same idea of community of uh, that we had in verse 13 here is a man who has has forcefully you know seized this this unbetrothed woman and has committed the the marriage act, if we will, uh, and so now he will be called to fulfill the obligations, the duties, uh, and the promises that he has shortcutted and foregone by 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 committing the marriage act before marriage. And he will care for her, and he will provide for her, and he will uh, he will see that that she is that she is treated as, as his wife. Um, and the community is, is going to make sure that happens. Um, and, and so will the Lord through the, the means that he has appointed. Um, 
so that she is provided for and she will have uh, a, a home and a household where where she may continue to to live and be supported in this community. Verse 30 then is the last part of our text. A man shall not take his father's wife so that he does not uncover his father's nakedness. This sounds like the the case that Paul has to deal with in 1 Corinthians 5, where a man is committing adultery with his own stepmother. We've got about four minutes here, Pastor Gribbenau, for this last one. Sure. In in the classical world, this was often done um, outside of the, the Israelite culture, though similar things had <laughs> happened within Israel, of the younger trying to, in effect, assert his authority and usurp the power of his of his father. And and so in the in the pagan cultures, this was done so that the the son could then, you know, basically effectively challenge the father and take the whole of the household for himself, uh, effectively sort of killing his dad and you know taking the whole of inheritance for himself. This was a matter of power and assertion, and by taking one of the concubines, we have this uh, with, uh, with with David and his son. You know that we have this. I'm going to assert my leadership. I'm going to take this and and prove that I am to be the one who should lead our household, lead our people, lead our nation. And so this is this is to say that is not how the the people of God are to are to work together. You know, we, we it is not a matter of stealing and thieving and 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 asserting your dominance by power and force, but we work together. We follow one another leadership is seen in Christ, this sacrificial giving and not this forceful taking. And so that is part of this prohibition because they would have seen, that is the people of Israel, would have seen this activity happening uh, within all the nation states around them, all the pagans, that that this is this is how your power structure works. And God says, no, that that is not how this works. But more than this, that we should, we should not, um, you know, in the fourth commandment, you know, you know, you should not, um, you know, despise your parents and others in authority by trying to seize and steal, you know, steal uh, their their leadership and their care for you, uh, but instead to uh, to honor and serve them and obey them and love and cherish them, trusting and knowing that God has has established them as your parents, uh, as your mom and dad, as as your mom and dad of the nation, you're, you're the, the nation's father, for your good, to serve you, to love you, to to be a, a reflection of the heavenly father for you in a physical, tangible, uh, earthly sense. Mm. Pastor Garbano, with just about a minute left, a difficult text today, and yet all there to protect the good of marriage. Help us to wrap this up and help us to see how how we see Christ in a text like this. I, I, we've sort of, I, 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 we, we began with it. We, we, we've talked about. It. Let's end with it. That marriage is Christ and His Church. Marriage is the the husband only and always doing what is best for his wife and for their children, no matter what that may entail. To do that, and for us, you know, the children, the wife, the spouse to trust and know that all that the husband does is for our good and for our benefit. And in our, in our, in our reality here, you know, husbands and wives will talk and discuss and converse with one another much as we do in the divine service. But, but when it comes down to it, when the husband says, this is how we shall do, this is what we shall do. It is, it is for your good. And it is always and only to serve and love and cherish you. And in the same way, we love and trust that our spouses will always be doing that for us. Uh, even if even if the old Adam in us or the old Eve says, I don't know about this, we, we, we put our, our, our love and our trust in, in our one flesh. Uh, and so marriage is um, this, this wonderful union of support and encouragement and care in times of good and in times of bad. Uh, the last thing I'll say is if we go back to Genesis, which is where we really first see, you know, earthly marriage, uh, the only thing that God said was not good in all of his creation was that man should be alone. And so then he brought forth a helpmeet, 
uh, someone who is complementary to Adam, that he should uh, love and cherish and serve, and that the two would be one flesh, that we have a wholeness and, and a fullness in in marriage, in husbands and wives, uh, to strengthen one another, to build one another up, to serve one another in love, and together to be to be complete, being built into built into Christ, who has called them to be one. Pastor Doug Gribbana is mission advocate for KFUO Radio in St. Louis, Missouri, helping us today with Deuteronomy 22, verses 13 to 30. Pastor Gribbana, thanks for being our guest today. My pleasure, brothers and sisters. My pleasure, uh, Brother Apple. I am your host here on Sharper Iron, Pastor Timothy Apple of Grace Lutheran Church in Smithville, Texas. Thanks for spending the morning with us. Talk to you again tomorrow.